Hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, back again with more of the most wonderfully fascinating and moving pieces of Greek tragedy. The Prometheus Bound, probably, maybe, by Aeschylus. I love Greek tragedy, Greek theater. It's just so interesting and beautiful, and it tells us so much not only about the mythological stories that are frequently told in the plays, but it tells us about the everyday world of ancient Athens and what they valued, how they saw the world around them, how some of them thought of their gods. Of course, the Prometheus Bound that's typically attributed to Aeschylus, because it can't be proven to be written by someone else, but that a lot of people seem to think it was likely written later, and by someone else, (laughs) the Prometheus Bound is a perfect example of a piece of ancient Greek literature and theater that says a lot, a lot, about how some of the ancient Athenians, at least, might have thought of their gods. It's fucking brilliant. But before we get back into the dark, tyrannical rule of Zeus, I want to let you all know that I'm going to be appearing at the Vancouver Podcast Festival this year. I did the podcast festival two years ago, and it was so much fun. And that was when it was live and in person, of course. And it was scary as hell, and I was so fucking nervous. And basically, I had a full-blown anxiety attack trying to edit myself, speaking in front of a crowd of people afterwards. Whew. But now, two years later, I look back and say, oh, that was fun, maybe? (laughs) But this time, well, this time, it's not in person, and so I'm not at all about worried about my anxiety, and it means that so, so many more of you can watch it. So I'm going to be doing a master class with another podcaster about building an audience for your independent podcast. So if you're into podcasting and thinking about starting one, or you already have one and want tips on trying to grow it, or you just want to see me speak on camera and sound all cool and fancy doing a master class, then you should come to the event. You should watch it. It's all live streamed, so you can watch it from anywhere. Tickets are on sale now for individual shows, events, or the full day of events. It's on November 20th, and my panel is at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, but I think you can stream it after the fact, too. Check the link in the episode's description or go to vanpodfest.ca for more information. That is v-a-n-p-o-d-f-e-s-t dot c-a for more information and to watch me seem cool and like I know what I'm talking about. (laughs) So what about that Prometheus guy? Just like last week, another huge thanks to Ash Strain for helping me with the research on this episode. Ugh, incredible notes. Where we last left the Prometheus Bound, Kratos and Bia, power and might, had dragged the titan god of foresight, Prometheus, up into the mountains of Scythia, the farthest edge of the world as far as the ancient Athenians thought of it, and they'd been accompanied by poor Hephaestus, who was ordered there to lash Prometheus up in unbreakable chains. All of this because Prometheus stole fire and brought it to the humans. And it was early in Zeus's new rule over that world, over after he'd taken it from Kronos and the Titans. And because of that, Zeus was just not having it. He's newly ruling this world. He fought a war over it. He defeated his father for it. And so he's working to cement his rule in the most violent and bloodthirsty way imaginable. He wants the humans subjugated, unable to keep themselves alive without the gods. And Prometheus fucked with that by giving them fire. So now he's being punished for it. Kratos, Bia, and Hephaestus leave Prometheus there to spend all of his days and nights chained up, alone, either in the horrible scorching heat of the sun during the day or the biting frosty cold of the nights. But before long, the chorus joins Prometheus, 
Oceanids, all of whom discuss the horror show that is this new rule of Zeus. Zeus the Tyrant. Now remember, tyranny is a huge fucking deal when it comes to ancient Athens. They had a few names for kings in ancient Greek, most notably Basileus and Tyrannos. Both mean king, but Tyrannos means a bad king, basically a king who took power by force and kept it through the same. That is what Zeus is doing, and it's how gods like Hephaestus, Prometheus, and the Oceanids speak of him. They're blunt and honest. They don't fear him, aside from Prometheus's current predicament, but they are willing to talk about his tyranny. And of course, there's much, much more to come on that front. But what I find most fascinating is how this compares to modern understanding of religion. As someone who grew up in North America, even though I'm not remotely religious, I've always existed in a world surrounded by Christianity, where God is all-powerful and all-seeing and he should be respected, if not outright feared. The ancient Athenians, and probably the Greeks pretty broadly, didn't necessarily see their gods that way. They were more about being kind of natural forces in the world than they were traditional deities that we think of now who just hold all the cards. They were seen as having much more human characteristics. They'd had wars and familial squabbles, just like the humans. The gods had generations that had come before, just like the humans. That meant that there were primordial ancient gods, and then the gods who took them out. And sometimes the primordial ones hung around, siding with the Olympian gods or staying neutral, and thus, even though they're older and more ancient, they too are now beholden to the power of Zeus. Specifically, primordial gods like Prometheus and Oceanus. Like I said last week too, I also think about this particularly in regards to how sometimes people yell at me online for talking shit about Zeus, because there are modern Hellenists out there who worship the ancient gods, and again, all the respect in the world for that, and more power to you. But if anyone thinks that I'm the first one to talk shit about Zeus, and therefore I'm wrong and modern and need to be yelled at on Instagram... Maybe read the Prometheus Bound, because the rest of the gods shit-talked Zeus too, and if this ancient playwright wasn't worried, then I don't need to be either. Yell at Aeschylus or maybe not Aeschylus before you yell at me. This is episode 145, The Tyranny of Zeus and Prometheus Bound. Prometheus, from his place on stage, bound at the hands and feet to the side of a mountain, reminds the audience all that has come before. The Oceanids ask him what's happened, and so he retells the story of the Titanomachy. I won't do that. I've covered it pretty recently on the podcast. It was quite the war. What's notable, though, is Prometheus is reminding the audience that while there was a war between gods and titans, he was on the side of the gods. It wasn't as though he'd sided with his fellow titans in their fight with Zeus. No, he'd thought about it thoroughly, and he'd decided to side with Zeus and the Olympians. He explains that, quote, It is by reason of my counsel that the cavernous gloom of Tartarus now hides ancient Cronus and his allies within it. Thus I helped the tyrant of the gods, and with this foul payment he has responded. For it is a disease that is somehow inherent in tyranny to have no faith in friends. Harsh words once more for that tyrannical king of the gods. Prometheus goes on to explain that when Zeus became ruler, he immediately planned to kill off the mortals, to just let them all die out and then start anew. But that Prometheus had had pity for them. He's definitely being a bit showy here, really emphasizing how heroic he was in saving the mortals from Zeus's wrath. He explains to the Oceanid Chorus, quote, 
Against this purpose, none dared make stand except me. I only had the courage. I saved mortals so that they did not descend, blasted utterly, to the house of Hades. He does not, however, explain how exactly he saved the mortals. That he gave them fire is a key point, but it doesn't come up until the Oceanids press him for what exactly he did to save the mortals and incur Zeus's wrath. So, finally, Prometheus does explain that he'd given the mortals fire, that he did it so that they could learn crafts and arts from it. That's why he's being punished, he tells the Oceanids. And how long will your punishment last? They ask him. There's no end to it, he explains, only whenever he chooses. That is, Zeus. Still, earlier, Kratos made a pointed comment about that, that no one had yet been born who could free him. That is, we're supposed to realize that it will be Heracles who finally does the job, but until Heracles is born and grows up and goes to save Prometheus, he is trapped there by the will of Zeus. Don't grieve for me, Prometheus asks the chorus. He knows what he did. He knew he would be punished for it, even if he didn't think it would be quite so bad as this. Still, Prometheus wouldn't take back his helping of the mortals. He's proud of what he's done. No, instead of grieving, he asks the chorus to listen to him, to keep him company, to share his burden. The chorus agrees wholeheartedly. They're on his side, and they want to do all they can. The Oceanids fly up to perch next to him. They want to continue listening to all the stories he has to tell. But it isn't the time for his stories just yet, because there's another titan who has come to visit Prometheus during his punishment. The primordial titan god Oceanus, the earth-encircling ocean itself, flies onto the stage now. That's right, he flies. Oceanus flies onto the stage, riding an enormous bird. Maybe even a fucking griffin. Oceanus flies in on a fucking griffin, really stealing the show at this moment. Fuck, imagine being in the audience for this, perched on your marble seat in the enormous amphitheater, and then somehow they've got yet another god flying in, this time riding a monstrous bird creature. <sighs> Oceanus is there to tell Prometheus that he is another god on his side, that while Oceanus is meant to side with Prometheus purely out of familial obligation, they're related. He would do it anyway because he can't think of another god he'd rather side with than Prometheus. And well, Prometheus now elects not to just appreciate the sympathy, the friendship, the companionship in his punishment. No, he's going to be a drama queen instead. Ah, uh, he says, you're here to gawk at me then? To laugh at my punishment? And I want to say Oceanus is like, no, dude, I just fucking told you I'm here because you're a good guy and I want to help you. But no, we kind of gloss over Prometheus's woe is me drama queen energy. He is, after all, being punished by the king of the gods. Still, take what you can get, Prometheus. He's there to be a friend. Ugh. Instead, Oceanus basically confirms that Prometheus should have known what he was doing, that he'd chosen to taunt Zeus to explicitly go against his rule in a pretty powerful way, and thus, the punishment isn't surprising. I want to help you, Prometheus, Oceanus tells him, but until I can sort out how to help you, you should hold your tongue. You are, as Ash rightfully summarized in their incredible notes, playing with fire. Ha, 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 ha. For real, that's a good one. Oceanus goes so far as to tell Prometheus that he will personally go to Zeus and ask him to release Prometheus from his punishment, and that he is certain that Zeus will listen. One would think that this offer would be met with thanks and excitement, but again, Prometheus is, at this point, really just enjoying his role as martyr. 
he doesn't want to give it up just yet, and he explicitly tells Oceanus not to bother asking Zeus to free him. Not to bother helping. Honestly, drama, queen, energy, martyr, complex. As much as I enjoy the Zeus is a tyrant talk, Prometheus is making it all a bit too much about himself, and we're left to wonder just how unreasonable and awful Zeus actually is. I mean, he is awful. But still, Prometheus is clearly also prone to exaggeration. So, no, don't help me, he tells Oceanus, before launching into yet another of what Ash calls Prometheus monologue hour. Prometheus claims that he doesn't want Oceanus' help because he doesn't want to see him punished too. He laments for himself, for his own punishment, and he recalls others who have faced punishment by Zeus. My brother, Atlas, he recalls, is forced to hold the very heavens upon his shoulders as though he's a pillar, and that weight is a horrible thing to bear. Atlas is Prometheus's brother in this version. Don't worry about sorting it out. There are so, so many versions of everything. And, he recalls, I pity not just Atlas, but even the monstrous creature Typhon. Yes, Prometheus is so against the tyranny of Zeus that he's pitying Typhon. Typhius. He thinks of Typhon in his caves, how he fought the gods. Quote, He withstood all the gods, hissing out terror with horrid jaws, while from his eyes lightened a hideous glare, as though he would storm by force the sovereignty of Zeus. Are you really trying to make Typhon sympathetic, Prometheus? But yes, he is. He continues explaining how Zeus struck him down with his lightning bolt and, quote, Now, a helpless and sprawling bulk, he lies hard by the narrows of the sea, pressed down beneath the roots of Etna, while on the topmost summit Hephaestus sits and hammers the molten ore. There, one day, shall burst forth rivers of fire with savage jaws devouring the level fields of Sicily, land of fair fruit, such boiling rage, shall Typhon, although charred by the blazing lightning of Zeus, send spouting forth with hot jets of appalling fire-breathing surge. Fuck, I love quoting this shit. With this, Oceanus once more tries to offer his help to Prometheus, but Prometheus insists he shouldn't bother. Of course, he phrases it as though he's the one doing Oceanus this huge favor by insisting the Titan not help him in his squabble with Zeus. But Prometheus's appreciation of his own punishment, his own martyrdom, is really coming across here. Oceanus tries his best, but finally he gives in. It sounds like you really just want me to go home, he offers to Prometheus. Yes, exactly. Head home and keep to yourself, Prometheus answers. And with that, Oceanus leaves the way he came, on his enormous monstrous bird that might have even been a griffin. Oceanus's role in this play is brief, but both interesting and really fucking cool to imagine. Thanks, Oceanus. You've been good to us. The chorus of Oceanids sing and cry for Prometheus. They're on his side once more, singing of the rule of Zeus and all the trouble that it's caused. The arrogance and self-serving laws. They sing and sing, describing all those of the world who now mourn for Prometheus. After a bit of response from Prometheus about his own plight, not to leave it out for even a single speech, he does finally turn to the plight of humanity. I don't think we're meant to feel for Zeus ever in this play, but there are still definitely points where you're supposed to think that maybe, just maybe, Prometheus has turned this into a bit of a self-serving nonsense on his part too. In the end, it seems humanity is the one most harmed by all of this Titan versus God bullshit. Listen, he says, quote, to the miseries that beset mankind, how they were witless before, and I made them have sense and endowed them with reason. How lucky humanity was to have Prometheus on their side. 
He does add, he isn't trying to insult humanity with this, not to bring them down. He's simply explaining how little they had before he brought them fire. With fire, they were able to do so many more things for themselves. The ancient Greeks certainly did have a good grasp on just how important fire was and just how much its invention changed humanity. It's interesting because obviously that would have happened so, 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 so long before these myths that were being sung by the poets even, let alone this play. Still, the way it changed humanity for the better was fresh in their minds and they thanked Prometheus for it. The Rom translation explains this beautifully. Quote, Though they had power of sight, they did not see. Hearing, they did not hear. Like shapes of dreams, they spent their whole lives shuffling things together in random patterns. Prometheus goes on to explain how fire brought them brick-built homes, shelter from the sun, how it brought them wood structures when all they had before was just hiding away in dark caves. He goes on, though, claiming to have given humanity more than even just fire. He says he showed them the seasons of the year, the stars in the sky. Numbers and letters were given to humanity by Prometheus, he says. And from all of these things came every art imaginable. He says he gave them the taming of horses, the building of ships. Everything, everything they have, I gave to them, Prometheus says. Again, taking a whole lot of credit for literally everything under the sun because it makes his status as a martyr all the more important. It makes his place now, under constant punishment, all the more tragic. Thank the gods for Prometheus. The chorus breaks in to say basically exactly this. They praise him for all he gave to humanity, and once again, they lament his current punishment. Fucking Zeus. They might as well all be saying. But wait, Prometheus continues, just wait until you hear everything else I gave them. And then he regales the chorus of Oceanids with another lengthy, lengthy list of things that he says he brought to humanity. Oh, what would they have done without him? What a savior he is. What a hero. I won't list everything that Prometheus claims to have given humanity because haven't I listed enough? But just imagine that it's really and truly everything. Like everything that humanity found beneficial, everything that saved them pain and heartache and injury over however many centuries of things being developed, everything that ever helped humanity in even the slightest of ways, Prometheus says he gave to them. In finishing this speech, Prometheus makes this explicit. In the Rom translation, he says, quote, To sum it all up in the briefest words, all arts that mortals use come from Prometheus. Which leaves me wondering, if you were going to sum it up all quite so succinctly, Prometheus, why didn't you save us all the time and energy of listening to those speeches? The Oceanids continue to be sympathetic to Prometheus. They tell him that if all of this is true, then he's sure to find a way to get himself free before long, that they hope he does, and that he becomes just as powerful as Zeus. Prometheus, though, begins to be a bit cagey. He says that his freedom isn't yet foretold by the fates, and they are the ones to decide. He goes so far as to explain that even Zeus is beholden to the fates, if no one else. The Oceanids ask, then, what else do the fates have in store for Zeus? I can't tell you that, Prometheus answers vaguely. You have a secret, then, they press. Let's speak of something else, Prometheus says, making clear he won't be telling them his secret. He explains that if he hides it, if he keeps his secret, then some day he will be free of these bonds, of this punishment. Dun-dun-dun. In answer to this vague statement by Prometheus, to the very idea that he has some secret of the fates worth keeping, the Oceaned Chorus continues their laments for his fate. They go on and on, and frankly, it's repetitive and pretty meh. Plus, what's most exciting comes at the end of their song, so let's jump ahead. Jump ahead to the moment when, 
As the chorus finishes their song of love, for Prometheus going so far as to talk of their singing around his bath and his bed on his wedding day? Which, weird, I have questions. Just as they finish singing about this love, Io comes on the scene as half cow. Fucking Io, you guys. Remember Io? No? Don't worry, she'll remind us all of who she is. Fucking badass cow queen of Greek myth. That's who Io is. Io, in her cow-like state, comes on stage in a wild frenzy. She's confused and in pain, and she's immediately asking who these people are before her, where she is, what is going on? She spots Prometheus and asks him what crime he's being punished for. That he's in the midst of a horrible punishment is clear, even in her confused state. Io is being hounded by a gadfly, bitten and followed, not only by this fly, but by a ghost, or a presence, or a memory? I, 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 she cries out. Quote, a gadfly, phantom of earth-born Argus, is stinging me again. Keep him away, O oh earth. I am fearful when I behold that myriad-eyed herdsman. Argus, that myriad-eyed herdsman. Sound familiar? Again, we'll get there. Io cries out. The gadfly is stinging her, and the memory of Argus is haunting her, watching her. She can't eat or sleep, and she just wanders. She wanders and wanders, and so she's ended up here. Wherever here is, no one has told her yet. She goes on, calling upon the common denominator, the thing she'll soon find that she has in common with Prometheus. Quote, O son of Kronos, in what have you found offense so that you have bound me to this yoke of misery? O son of Kronos, what did she do exactly? Io and Prometheus speak now. She's asked him where she is and who he is, and he answers. I am Prometheus, he tells her, and I am the one who gave fire to humans. Prometheus, she answers, excitedly, grateful for this gift to humans. Why, then, do you deserve punishment? Prometheus tells her that he's just finished his story, the long and lengthy tale of his troubles. Would you offer me just a bit of the story, Io asks, since I missed it. She limits what she wants Prometheus to tell her, and for that, we're all appreciative. It's time for Io's speeches now. I have heard enough from Prometheus. Prometheus tells her very little. She's not that interested. Zeus had me punished, he tells her, but Hephaestus was the one to do it. Why, he tells her? That much he's already said. Suddenly Prometheus isn't one for making lofty speeches about his own importance. It's quite the shift. So, she asks... If you're not going to speak more about your own story, tell me of mine. She asks Prometheus, the god of foresight, to tell her how much more wandering she has to do. Why is Io wandering? Again, we'll get there. For now, know that this poor woman has been transformed either into a full cow or a half cow, the latter more so for the visual of the play than anything else. She's been wandering all around the world for what feels like ever. She has wandered and wandered, constantly hounded by the gadfly, the fly that bit her and bit her and forced her to always keep moving, always keep walking, even though she had no plan or anywhere to go or anyone to see. She's been sad and aimless, punished by the gods in a similar way to Prometheus, though when it comes to Io, the woman, as you might expect given Greek myth, she did nothing wrong. Prometheus tells her that it's better if she doesn't know, which, I mean, is kind of an answer in itself. It doesn't sound like your wandering is ending anytime soon, Io. She presses him, though, for more information. What does he know that she doesn't? Prometheus is about to explain more, not one to turn down the opportunity for more speeches, but the chorus stops him. Now wait just a minute, 
Prometheus, before you speak, why not let Io tell us her story? According to the Rom translation, the chorus requests of Prometheus, quote, Allow us first to learn of her disease, and let her tell the perils in her past. Then you can add the sequel of her sufferings. Io, 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 what is your story? Io feels comfortable with Prometheus and the chorus of Oceanids. We're told even that the Oceanids are her father's sisters. They're all divine and thus related. But it gives Io a bit of comfort as she begins to tell her story to the chained and punished Prometheus and his gang of kind Oceanids. Io begins. The quotes I'm going to use here come from the Rom translation, because I like his Io better. The older translation that I've been referring to mostly makes Io ashamed of what she's about to share, whereas Rom makes her grief-stricken. What a difference when it comes to treatment from the gods. She begins, quote, You'll learn in clear words everything you ask, though telling it brings grief. The god sent storm that wrought this transformation of my body from where it came to strike a wretched girl. Io tells Prometheus and the Oceanids about dreams she began having late at night while she was asleep in the comfort of her home. She began to have visions that told her that she was being wanted by Zeus. Her dreams told her that the king of the gods wanted her, that explicitly he wanted to have sex with her, though it's likened to marriage in the visions. Why stay a virgin when you could have Zeus? Is a very real and accurate paraphrase of these dreams Aya was having. The visions continued. They told her to go to Lerna, where her father kept flocks and herds of animals, there, in the deep meadows, she could meet with Zeus so that, quote, the eye of Zeus may cease from longing. Gross. Finally, Io has been haunted by these dreams and visions for so long and is so bothered by them that she speaks to her father and tells him what she's been experiencing. Her father, in response, sends messengers both to Delphi and to the oracle at Dodona, asking what they should do to stem the gods' advances on Io. Finally, she explains, her father hears that he must force her from her home, lock her out, force her to wander aimlessly everywhere but her home. Otherwise, Zeus would strike him and the rest of his family down with thunderbolts. Once more, we're learning of the deep and tragic tyranny that is the god Zeus. Once more, we're emphasizing the villainy of this king of the gods. It wasn't just Prometheus who had his future ruined by Zeus, but Io, too. Her father does this. He kicks her out of her home and locks the doors behind her. She's left to wander alone Nowhere to go and no one to stay with. And Io tells her rapt audience, as she wanders, she begins to transform. The further she wandered, the more complete the transformation became. She was, from then on, a cow. And not only was she transformed into a cow because she sought to avoid having sex with Zeus, but she was being hounded by a gadfly and was watched constantly by the herdsman Argus. Argus, you may remember, was a hundred-eyed herdsman of Hera sent to watch Io as she wandered, aimlessly as a cow, all the while being stung by this horrid gadfly. Still, that he was sent by Hera is not entirely clear in this play. Finally, though, and unexpectedly, Argus died, and she was, once again, completely alone, save for the fly and its stings. 
As her story ends, Io turns to Prometheus and speaks to him directly, saying, quote, You've heard what's happened. If you know anything about the toils ahead, speak out. Don't give me the comfort of false tales, for I proclaim invented words to be the basest illness. And so, with Io's story of her fate at the hands of Zeus, we're left with another direct and explicit example of what a tyrannical, horrible ruling god he has turned out to be. Oh, nerds, thank you all so much for listening. That one was so much fun to record. (laughs) This story of Io is interesting, like basically every other moment of this fascinating play, but Io's story here is different from the more traditional version of her story. The playwright here, maybe Aeschylus, seems to want to make her story a little less fanciful and a little more directly caused by the tyrannical rule of Zeus. Traditionally, Zeus finds and assaults Io, or maybe it's consensual for a while, it's always so unclear. Regardless, traditionally they're together and she's punished by Hera for Zeus's actions. Argus is Hera's watchman, who's then killed by Hermes just so that Zeus can once again get to his cow lover Io, because he's fucking awful. But here it's not about Hera. She's kind of implied with Argus, but even he is brief in Io's story. This take on Io is about Zeus punishing her for not wanting to fuck him. It's about Zeus causing this woman so much torment for rejecting him. It's about Zeus and what a horror show of a god he is. It's refreshing, honestly, to have it not be about Hera's jealousy and instead about the actual actions of the shit king of the gods, Zeus. Io is a character that I first covered in, like, the second or third episode of this podcast, and I don't think I've ever revisited her, but she's really so fascinating. There's a lot there in terms of treatment of Zeus and how women are affected, whether they do or do not sleep with him. Io deserves more, so I'm thrilled she has such a role in Prometheus Bound, where the message is explicitly about how awful Zeus is. Fucking fascinating, as if I haven't used that word enough between these two episodes. Next week will be the final episode of Prometheus Bound, so stay tuned. Plus, as I mentioned last week, we have some amazing conversation episodes coming up, in addition to a whole slew that have been planned out and exciting episodes that I can't wait to dive into and share with you all. I do love how detailed my research is now, how deep I can go into these stories and characters, and how much you enormous nerds seem to want to hear about it. You're all the best. And once again, I will leave this with a five-star review from a lovely listener, because thank you. This time from someone named Stuart Pearson Wright in the UK. Glorious listening! I love everything about this podcast. The subject matter is of course fabulous, but in the wrong hands can be delivered in a dry manner. Liv's retelling of the story is entertaining, irreverent, knowledgeable, funny, and incisive. I love how Liv interprets the stories through a prism of contemporary gender politics and feminist thinking, bringing an important, critical element to the mythological characters and what they represent. Thank you so much, Liv, and keep them coming. Thank you! Honestly, again, these truly make my day. It's a little weird really reading them aloud because they're so self-serving, but I just, I really want to show how important they are to me, to the podcast, to its growth, but also just like how happy they make me. So truly, thank you. If you haven't already, consider giving me a five-star review. They really, really honestly make a huge difference. You are all the absolute best. Next week, more Io, more Prometheus. I am Liv, and I love this shit.